my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's guest is Joni Edelman, who I met recently and was actually roomies with at the Fourth Trimester Bodies Project Conference in Portland, and we hit it off right away and, of course, swapped birth stories. She's going to be sharing her most recent birth story today, which she recently wrote an article about on ravishly.com, where she's the editor-in-chief, and it was kind of a, a lot of comments and back and forth about people's opinions of this article. So I want her to share her birth story first, and then we'll talk a little bit about how that was received. At the end of the episode, I'm going to share who our Thursday guest will be, which is a really exciting guest. So be sure to listen to the end to find that out. Hi, Joni. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for being here today to share your birth story with us. Thank you for having me, Bren. Let's start off by telling everyone a little bit about you and your family. I am an RN who's not practicing currently. I'm the editor and chief at ravishly.com, which is, I like to call our huggy feminist website. We like to celebrate the positive parts of feminism. I've got five children ranging in ages from four to just about to be 21. My first baby was a loss at 21 weeks, my first daughter. So covering, covering a big range of ages. Um, we live in California. I work from home mostly. My husband works in software, and we just do our thing, run around after all these teenagers and stay real busy. <laughs> okay. Well, I know we're going to mostly focus on your most recent birth today. So why don't we start off by talking a little bit about that pregnancy and the type of birth you were planning on based on kind of your previous experiences and everything you knew about birth at that point? Sure, sure. So my most recent pregnancy um, and delivery is Max, Maxwell Rocket. His middle name's Rocket. <laughs> he just turned four. So I was about, let's see, I must have been 37 when I was pregnant with him. So, you know, technically advanced maternal age or whatever. Uh, my first three kids were completely unremarkable births, just born in a hospital, um, no real complications, no problems. My third baby, I had a postpartum hemorrhage, but not very serious. I didn't need a transfusion. And he basically delivered himself. So I got divorced, I got remarried, and we decided to have another baby. That was baby number four. And my husband was in support of home birth. So we decided to proceed with that. And we hired a very experienced midwife from a nearby town who's been delivering babies for like 35 years. And then we also hired a backup midwife. What's kind of important to Max's story is Ella's story, the baby before him. Her birth culminated in the idea that we were, we were becoming this family of all of us after I'd been divorced and remarried. And to my mind, she was going to be kind of like the glue. She was like the thing we all had in common, you know, and the other kids would feel included in our marriage and, and in our, the new family with her birth. So everybody was there, all of the kids. They were, let's see, 10 I guess 10, 12, and 15 at the time. And pregnancy with her was pretty unremarkable. I was gigantic. I gained a lot of weight because I had lost a lot of weight right before I got pregnant with her. My water broke at home. Everything was totally normal, fine, no problems. Um, the midwife kind of figured I would go quickly because fourth baby, but that did not happen. <laughs> it took a long time to get her born. And ultimately on her way out, we had a shoulder dystocia. So that was, it was tough. And I should say that I'm, I was a labor and delivery nurse for five years. So I do have experience with birth crisis, you know, birth in general, but also, also birth crisis. So my midwife and I knew pretty much what to do to handle it. I stayed, I was kind of um, semi-reclined in the water, which is why she got stuck more than likely because my pelvis wasn't, you know, at its maximum open capacity. And she was big. She was almost 11 pounds. We tried to push that way and it wouldn't happen because she was underwater because we were, you know, I was, my body was submerged. She didn't really have, she didn't have that drive to breathe. So it actually bought us some time and ultimately I ended up rolling onto my hands and knees and pushing her out that way. So it all ended up well. She needed some help getting started, but very classic shoulder dystocia. I was glad that I had her at home because 
we were able to give her some oxygen and get her started breathing with me and she didn't have to be whisked away to anywhere. But it was a little bit traumatic. It was a little bit frightening. Not so much in it as much as it was after it. And I have a video of the entire thing and watching it was very sort of nerve wracking because the people around me who didn't really know what was going on thought she was going to die. You know, it was, it was, they were scared because they didn't have birth experience. The midwife and I were okay, but everyone else was, was frightened. So were your older children there for that birth? Yeah, they were. My 12 year old was not in the room at that time. He was upstairs because he doesn't like blood. The funny thing is my 10 year old, I have pictures of him holding my shoulders. He was right there the whole time. And he's the first person that saw her head. He was down in the water and they have this really hilarious picture of him pointing at the water, like looking so shocked. But I don't, I don't think it frightened them. In fact, I think it was a good experience for them to see that, you know, you can remain calm and handle problems because had we been in a hospital, the outcome would have been the same and we wouldn't have done anything different. I would have flipped over. She would have been born. We would have given her some blow by oxygen and she would have been fine. It's the same she was. It's not like I would have been rushed to the OR or anything. And I was confident in my midwife's ability to handle it. But yeah, they were there. And my daughter, my oldest daughter and her are like super bonded. They are so, so, so close. There's 15 years between them. But I think part of it is because she was there. You know, she was the first person to hold her right after me. So she put her first diaper on, all that. <clears throat> anyway, so when Max, when I got pregnant with Max, there certainly was some trepidation because once you've had one shoulder dystocia, you're more at risk to have another one. So there was that. Also, just getting older and, you know, just the general nature of being pregnant at 37. And But we, we addressed all of that and we decided to go ahead and have another home birth. I had my midwife, who's associated with the hospital that I used to work at, as a backup. The same home birth midwife I had had before. So everything was just sort of status quo. I saw the hospital midwife several times during the pregnancy just to create a relationship with her and her office so that should I need her for something she would be available. The pregnancy with him was very difficult, probably because they're really close together. They're only 17 months apart. And I ended up with pelvic symphysis dysfunction, which is basically like your pelvis comes apart in the front. Ooh. Like my pelvis is just separating during my whole pregnancy. And I was like wearing this thing wrapped around my abdomen, trying to keep my pelvis, you know, in one piece. But other than that, and having to crawl around on the floor, his pre the pregnancy with him was easy. Um, I <laughs> Other than the crawling around. <laughs> um, I, I, they were worried because of Ella's size. You know, everyone was kind of like, maybe you were diabetic and didn't know. So I took my blood sugar every day. I took my blood sugar in the morning. Just doing a glucose tolerance test to me was like whatever. I wanted to have a bigger picture. So I took my sugar every day for several months, um, twice, like in the morning when I got up fasting and then again after a meal to make sure it was good. And it's, it was actually always really low. <laughs> like you can go get some food low. So um, really, I just make big babies. My other, my other babies just sort of, I had my first live birth was seven. She was almost eight pounds. And then the second baby was nine pounds. And then his brother was eight pounds. So it wasn't like they were tiny. Although 11, almost 11 pounds was kind of a shock. <laughs> so the pregnancy with him was, other than that whole crawling around thing, was just very standard. My, you know, everything was great. My blood pressure is always great. My sugars were always great. I went to a therapist during that pregnancy. I, I started seeing a therapist who deals with maternal and perinatal, prenatal stress, postpartum, anxiety, all of that, or the sort of the mood spectrum stuff around pregnancy and birth. And um, we talked through sort of the fear of having another dystocia. And we felt pretty good about it, you know, going into it. Um, the midwife, my hospital midwife was like, it's fine. You can call me if there's a problem. The hospital is really close to your house. The hospital I wanted to go to is like 25 minutes away because it's the one I worked at. But there was a hospital like less than two miles from my house. The end of the pregnancy with him was basically a week of labor almost. I was having contractions all the time. And I did the same thing with Ella, what they call pro prodromal labor. So basically nothing's happening. You're just in agony for no reason. So I wasn't really sleeping. You know, it was I was awake all, all the time thinking, is this going to be labor? Is this going to not be labor? What's going to happen? getting up in the middle of the night, taking bubble baths, trying to stop my uterus from contracting. Um, so when I finally did go into labor with him, I was just a couple of days past my due date. I got up in the middle of the night, my water broke, kaboom, in, in the bed. And um, 
I woke everybody up, woke my husband up, woke my daughter up because she was going to watch after the little one, called all my people, called my midwife. She said, oh, I'll be there in the morning. You know, things didn't seem to be moving any faster than they had been in terms of contractions. Called my doula, got up. I made a cake. My husband filled the pool. I made a cake in the previous birth too. It was kind of my thing, like to bake a chocolate cake. And then we all ate it after she was born. Um, so it was a fun way to keep sort of distracted and then also have cake <laughs> at the end of the birth. Um, so I did that and we kind of just hung around and things were just kind of putting. Nothing was really happening, leaking fluid and just contracting per usual. Went through the day, same thing. Contractions started to peter out, um, probably because my uterus was just so damn tired from an entire day of, you know, weeks of contracting and then a day of trying to get a baby out. So I started doing the delicious black and blue cohosh tinctures, this foul, foul, foul thing, but they do actually work. And I was still nursing my older child. So I was breastfeeding her and using the pump and keeping contractions going. And day turned into night and we were sort of in the same place. And then I had her do an exam. We were kind of limiting exams because my water had been broken. So she had done one when she arrived. And then we hadn't done any other ones until pretty late in the evening, like around dinner time or after. And I was like seven centimeters. Um, so great. Okay, we're moving along. Things are going to be great. But still, contractions didn't seem to be coming closer together. It was basically like transition, but I wouldn't transition. I was just stuck. So we went upstairs. My husband and I took a shower together. Um, he rubbed my back. We decided to try to lay down. And we did. And he zonked out. And I slept off and on. And then when we woke up, we made the decision to transfer. Um, I'd been having some bleeding. Things were really getting closer together. He was really floating. He hadn't really engaged. And we were certainly mindful of the fact that it, he might be another repeat dystocia because sometimes that's a thing that happens, right? That's like a, a baby won't get in place because it's too big to do that. So we decided to transfer. Um, and everybody, the birth team went with me, my midwife, my doula, and we called in my hospital midwife and she was great. She came in and she said, hey, we can um, do a section right now. We'll take you back to the OR and you can be holding your baby in 15 minutes or um, we can wait this out and I think you can get him out. I think your pelvis is roomy enough um, for whatever reason he's not settling in it. But I think if we work for a while and we give you a little bit of Pitocin to regulate, get these contractions sort of in a more regular pattern that we can do it. So that's what we did. That's what she did. We, she gave me a little Pitocin and she, bless her heart, I just appreciate her so much. She sat at my bedside all night long and helped move his head and basically force him to be engaged because his head, he was like asynclitic, like his head was like a little bit sideways. It turned out that his head was 38 centimeters, which is gigantic. <laughs> So that explains it. I think literally that the second biggest head I've ever seen on a baby, and that's after working in labor and delivery for all those years. Right. Um, but once he got engaged, uh, she said to me, oh, he's going to be born by 7 a.m. We had gotten to the hospital around 1230. She said, oh, he's going to be he's going to be born at 7. And sure enough, he was born at 655 in two hefty pushes. I said, oh, I need to push. And she said, OK, let's do it. And I pushed and he just flew right out, like didn't even need, you know, there was not even a hint of a dystocia. So all of that was for naught, you know, all of the worry, everything turned out fine. Thankfully, the staff knew me because I worked there for so many years. Um, I had a nurse who was my friend. My day shift nurse was my friend. You know, the anesthesiologist was my friend and they were all, everybody was around. Oh, I got, I ended up with an epidural at the end, which is a thing I didn't want, but I had, my pelvis was essentially like breaking. And so I wasn't just having contractions. I was having like, like bone pain. So that was the other thing she recommended. Let's let's set, let's give you an epidural as things were sort of not progressing. So that actually that helped, I'm sure, really low dose um, epidural. But anyway, I was very lucky that everybody knew me and they knew I didn't want anything major hands on. So they um, let me go. They just signed me out. She came into the room. The midwife said, um, "Do you want to go home right after he was born?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, "You want your placenta?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, "Okay, <laughs> it is. Just don't tell anybody I gave it to you." She just handed it to me in a bucket. She said, "Do you?" You want to sign? You want to sign the baby out and not have any um, meds? And I said, yeah. And so she she signed me all out, and we went we went home. Two hours, less than two hours after he was born, we were back in our house, introducing him to everybody. And I was bummed out. You know, I was really sad about the transfer, but you know, he was home, and it was great. Of course, I was tired, and then afterwards, I had a little more time to process the transfer, and I was I really struggled with it 
for a long time, which is what I, I wrote an article about. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like how you were emotionally during the transfer and at the yeah. hospital? Yeah. So when we decided to transfer and we went downstairs and we said, okay, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to go ahead and go. Part of the reason that I had that I wanted to be at home was because I wanted the kids to be there and I didn't want to be separated from Ella because I had never been away from her before. She was still breastfeeding. You know, she was still sleeping in our bed. She was still very connected to us. And, and I thought I couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine leaving her. So when we decided to transfer and everybody was like, okay, it's fine. It's fine. I just, I just sobbed. Now I was tired, <laughs> you know, to be fair, it had right. been a long labor, but I just could not, it was just uncontrollable. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I, I got clothes on and I cried and I packed my bag and I cried and my daughter came up and well, then 15 year old came up and she hugged me and she said, mom, it's gonna be okay. You know, and I, everybody was just around trying to be supportive. And I was just sobbing. I was just so sad because I, this image of what I had in my mind, you know, he was going to be born in our house with all these people around him. And we were going to do everything right. Make sure that, you know, my positioning was right and everything was good so that his birth was smooth. And I was going to, you know, feel accomplished because part of what happened after Ella was I felt really like a failure in a way, not because, you know, she was born and she was healthy and all that, but I felt like my body should have known what to do and that I should have listened to it and been able to move myself in a way that I wouldn't have essentially probably caused the dystocia with my poor pushing position, but it didn't happen. So to me, the birth with Max was going to be sort of a resolution. Like, okay, this is going to be, I'm going to culminate all of this into you're not, you're not broken. You know, you hear this a lot with C-section moms too. They feel really broken when their body doesn't function the way that they think it should. Like, why couldn't I just get my baby out? It's the most natural human thing to do, but I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I felt. So leaving to me was an admission of, it was just an admission of failure. Like I couldn't do this. And the pain, you know, feeling really overwhelmed by pain uh, was like, I felt weak. You know, I'd done natural childbirth. It wasn't a big deal. So the fact that all of a sudden I was like, I can't cope with this agony felt really felt weak to me in a way. Although, you know, my, my first obstetrician I ever had said, nobody wins a medal for like natural birth. You realize this, right? You don't get like a prize at the end. But we do know scientifically that there is somewhat of a prize because that pain feedback loop with hormones makes a difference. And it does, there have been a lot of studies that show that that pain creates the endorphin rush, which creates a very different response after the delivery. So anyway, I cried. We got in the car. He drove. I cried. I cried and I had contractions and I just was having contraction after contraction sitting, which was horrible. And I was just crying. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to have to go. Why can't my body just do this? What is wrong with me? Um, and I got to the hospital and the nurse that did my intake was another friend of mine. And she said, oh, well, you know, I'm glad. Of course, nurses, a lot of the time, they're not in favor of home birth because they see the most horrifying things happen. So in their mind, you know, that's the most horrifying thing. But the truth is, in the number of the thousands of babies that I saw born, there's only a very small number of them that are an emergency, you know what I mean, or a negative outcome. It's just that you really only have to see one, and then you're sort of jaded, even if, even if the data says that you're perfectly safe at home. So I think a lot of them were very jaded. But even then... They were very sweet to me and, and I cried and I said, I don't want to be here. And she was like, I know. She said, I know, but we're going to take care of it. It's going to be great. And I cried when the midwife told me, you know, I just cried and cried and cried. I just felt like just absolute, just shit. And of course, when he's born, you know, okay, the baby's here and you did it and it's over. So you're happy because you've got the baby. Then of course the processing happens later, you know, the processing of what actually occurred and it just so happened I had a friend that was pregnant and due. We were due 10 days apart. And she was here during the labor and ended up delivering early three days after he was born. And she had a completely complication-free, super easy home birth. So it was kind of like a, you know, she called me while she was in labor and I was just, I cried. I was just walking, I was walking around the house holding my crying newborn, just crying myself thinking, why couldn't I just do this? You know, why couldn't it just be that easy for me? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to link to the article that you wrote from the show notes page. So maybe we can spend a few minutes just kind of talking about the message behind that and how like these four years of processing have gone for you and what 
some of the reactions are that you get to speaking out about it. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it's not like I walk around every day being, you know, grief stricken that right. I didn't get the birth I wanted. That would be ridiculous. It would be ridiculous for me at this point because I, I'm a rational human being. You know, I'm not just walking around sullen all the time, but especially around the time that he's born or when someone else I know has a baby, I recall the feelings that I had. And, you know, I've been to therapy and I've done all of that. But I wrote the article because I know many women who have had birth experiences that were negative. Either they had a C-section and they didn't want one. They planned a home birth and they had to transfer. Um, They had a hospital birth that was medicalized or a doctor that was mean or a procedure that they didn't want that was inflicted upon them. You know, people talk about having monitors inserted against their will, this sort of thing. And you'll hear people say, you know, well, birth isn't about you. It's about the baby. But the truth is, is that birth is about mothers because our birth experience That's the basis of our mothering. And when it happens, it doesn't mean it affects everyone that way. But when it doesn't happen the way that you want, you're left to deal with those feelings, whether it's a feeling of loss or a feeling of failure or a feeling of anger, whatever the feeling you're having is yours to deal with. And I know many, many women that have been through that who mourn, literally mourn the loss of the thing that they didn't get. It happens a lot in C-section moms and there's a lot of work to be done there. So I wrote it. I wrote this article, you know, my labor and delivery didn't go as it was as I wanted it to. And I, and I'm not over it basically to say, I don't have to be over it. I can be in pain and pain is relative. And just because I had a healthy baby doesn't mean I'm not still sad because that's sort of the fallback, right? Well, your baby's healthy. You shouldn't care, but that's moot because it, you, you do care. Um, if you don't care, great, that's fine for you. If you don't, if it's not something that bothers you, or you can process it and be over with it, then awesome. But if you aren't one of those people and you do care, you care deeply. I mean, many women are very, very damaged emotionally, physically by their births. You know, women that have profound tearing or, you know, postpartum hemorrhage or any of the things that happens to your body can be traumatic, you know, and that's the reality is, is that your body goes through a lot and it, and it does say something about you, how it processes your birth in your mind, even if it's not true, you know, you see, you you think that, right? You feel that. In publishing the article, I got a lot of really great responses from people who I know who said to me, you know, wow, this is so true. You know, this is the experience I had. I relate to this so much. And that's what I meant to happen. Mm -hmm. But um, somebody picked up the article, a woman who's known for sort of trolling home birth people specifically, and her minions came after me and really just spewed a lot of vitriol all over the article because that's sort of just the thing that she does. And she's she's taken down bloggers and women um, over over less, but she she took a piece of my article and she actually shared it on her own blog, which sent a lot of these people to my site calling me narcissistic and selfish and stupid and, you know, pitying my children for having me as a mother and, you know, all of this just horrible, horrible stuff, which came out of nowhere to me. And I I get a lot of trolling for my body articles. I get a lot of people calling me disgusting and ugly and whatever. But this, it was a little, it was a little more painful because you're, you're literally insulting my my mothering, insulting the thing that I do that's the most like important thing to me, telling me that I don't care about my children just because my birth was not what I wanted and because I'm sad about it. So that that's hard. That was a hard that's a hard thing to go through. Even though I do recognize that probably that hate comes from a place of, you know, whatever they're dealing with, as right. most most hate does. Yeah, I feel like we talk a lot on the podcast about everyone processes their birth story differently and it's not up to anyone to say, like, you should feel this way or that way. Right. I think, you know, and I, and I, I lost a baby. I, I know the pain of losing a child. I lost my first baby and it was hard to get pregnant with her and she died and it was horrible. And then it was hard to get pregnant with my second baby. So I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm flippantly saying, oh, well, my grief is huge. And I'm definitely, you know, I never would compare my grief to anyone's grief, whether it's the loss of a child or the loss of something else. The point is, 
pain is universal and we all have it. I think that's the thing. And to me, with my work with Ravishly too, the most important thing that we, that we say that I always tell people is we're all in this shit show together. Like my job every day is to support people who are struggling in whatever that struggle may be. And that's your story. And I honor whatever your story is. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to feel. So that's the thing that's so upsetting to me because these women are mothers. There are people also raising children saying that, you know, the natural birth industry is, is making women feel like failures because it's an, you know, an ideal that they can't reach. And it's one of them said, it's just as bad as cosmetic and, and modeling and those industries that make people feel shitty for their body size. And <laughs> I don't think so because no midwife is getting rich. I have zero midwives. Do I know that are like rolling around in cash, <laughs> making people feel ashamed for not giving birth at home, you know? And that's the thing. I mean, my midwife was not She's not like, well, you suck because you couldn't give birth in your house. She was like, hey, we'll do whatever we need to do to make this work. You know, that's her job as a midwife. And just like when I went in and she said to me, hey, if you want a C-section, we can do that. Like, you've been through a lot. You've been in labor a long time. I believe you must be exhausted. And I support you if you want to go to the OR right now. I will take you back and I will, and I will do it for you, you know. But at the same time, she gave me that encouragement of if you don't want to do that, I'm here and I will help you and we can do this. I know you can do it, but it's your choice. You know, there was no shaming. And even after the fact, when I talked to her and I said, did, you know, was everybody at the hospital like whispering behind my back about how dumb I was for trying to have a home birth? And she said, no, if anything, people respect you making choices, you know, making a smart decision, making a decision to have a home birth, making a decision to transfer, you know, you were making intelligent choices. You weren't just haphazardly you know, putting your life or someone, your child's life in, in danger. And that was one of the things a lot of people said to me was, why, why would you, you're so selfish. Why would you risk your child's life to have a home birth? Because you wanted to birth in your kitchen, you know? And, and it's like, well, <laughs> it's not just about me. It's about how they're welcomed into the world too. You know, you tell me that a baby who's welcomed in a, in a peaceful environment, if that's, that's like a bad thing, you know, that's not a bad thing. It, we, we do the best we can by our kids, whether that's trying to keep things dim in a room at the hospital or trying to reunite babies who've been, you know, a C-section with their moms as soon as we can. We just, you know, we try to put babies where they need to be with their mamas as much as we can do it. So it's like, it is hurtful to me that people who are mothers too, who have been through labor and been through birth and ostensibly would know those feelings would be so just mean, just some of the things they wrote, like I had to stop reading the comments. They come to me because I'm editor in chief of the website, you know, like I can read them, but I don't want to. <laughs> you know, I have to like just delete. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend not reading those comments at all. Well, are there any resources that you found either with like pregnancy and birth or postpartum that you would refer people to other than just maybe a therapist? <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of really great books about, gosh, I have to look the one up. I've given it away. It's some, it's specifically sort of designed for C-section moms about mourning the loss of, you know, the birth you thought you were going to have. But I think the most important thing or the best thing that we can do for each other is to talk to each other because there's nothing like solidarity in these sort of situations to have somebody say to you, if I had one woman wrote me and said, I needed to read this so bad because I am in so much pain and no one can hear me. No one will listen to me say, I feel like I failed, you know? And, and so hearing someone say, I'm sad, this didn't turn out how I wanted and I'm bummed out about it is, you know, it's, it's edifying to the people who are struggling with that. Just like anything in life, solidarity, right? Anytime you hear another person going through the thing you're going through, you're like, yes, oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this thing, this miserable thing. Yeah. What would you recommend for people who feel like they can't find that? Is there anywhere that you would send them to try to find someone to talk to? I mean, there are support groups for that sort of thing. There are pregnancy loss, birth trauma support groups. And you can, you can find that stuff in a lot of places, even in a regular community like the Leaky Boob. Jessica runs the Leaky Boob is um, a friend of mine. She, you know, she sort of has this, there's a community and they develop right out of that community, the, the little sub subgroups. But I didn't have anybody, you know, there was nobody that I could pinpoint that had that experience. What I did is I just saw people out. I have a Twitter mom tribe, you know, and I just saw people out. I said, this is hurting. And there's so many people willing to talk about it. 
Did you feel like you couldn't find you couldn't talk about it like with your friend who had the great yeah, home birth three days later? Not. No, I mean I love her. We're we're still very dear dear friends, but no, I couldn't say to her you had the birth I didn't get and I'm sad about it because I didn't want to demean, you know, I didn't want to take anything away from her experience, which was amazing. Right. I would, you know, she doesn't have to feel guilty for having a beautiful home birth, but that's just like, just like saying I can have my pain. She doesn't have to have my pain and I don't want to put that on her, you know, and I had a lot of friends having babies around that time that had babies very, you know, we were all pregnant together and everyone had a smooth delivery except me, you know, so it, there was a lot of grieving. And I have a friend who um, has had a C-section and then attempted a VBAC and had another C-section. And she actually just told me last week, right before I wrote this article, she said to me, every time someone has a baby, my heart just breaks because they're just getting to do a thing. You know, she wanted that experience of delivering her baby herself. You know, she didn't want her baby pulled from her body, you know, and it, and it hurts her that it happened. And, you know, it doesn't hurt all women, but it hurts her. And she still struggles and her youngest child is three and she's still watching people around her have kids and still trying to figure out how to, how to cope with it, you know, but she feels the same way. Like her sister just had a baby. She can't tell her sister, I'm jealous of your birth. She wants her sister to be happy with her birth. You know what I mean? Right. Well, is there a final message that you would leave with the listeners today about just kind of everything you've talked about? Well, I would say whatever you've gone through, your pain is valid. Whatever you, whatever has happened to you, you deserve to to celebrate it or mourn it or grieve it or whatever you feel like you need to do with it. And no one has the right to tell you how you should feel. Even the experts, you know, you get to you get to cope with and process your birth experiences however you need to, and seek help however you need to find it. And they can call me <laughs> if they need someone to commiserate with. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joni. Can you share with listeners where they can connect with you online, speaking of reaching out to you? Yeah, they can find me at ravishly.com, all of my writing there. Um, they can find me on Instagram and Twitter just by my name, Joni Edelman as one word. Um, my Twitter handle is Joni Baloney, but you can find me by searching my name. <laughs> and I'm always on social media, on Facebook. I have a professional page and a personal page that has that I'm friends with a lot of people on anyway, even though they're not my family or whatever, which is probably better. Um, <laughs> you can find me. I'm all over the internet if you Google my name. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll link to all that stuff from the show notes page so people can go there to find everything. And thank you so much again for taking the time today to share with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks again, Joni. If you want to find links to Joni's social media information and Ravishly article, head to thebirthhour.com and we'll put all of those things on her show notes page. And now for an exciting announcement. I'm so excited to share that Christy Turlington is going to be coming on the podcast this Thursday in celebration of Mother's Day. If you don't know, Christy Turlington Burns is a mom as well as a supermodel, and she's the founder of the maternal health organization Every Mother Counts. She's going to be talking about her births, which she endured a childbirth complication during her first birth, which was what led her to create Every Mother Counts, which provides safe births for women around the world. So I'm so excited to have her on to talk not only about her births, but also the work that she does through Every Mother Counts. And if you haven't already seen on other episodes or on the website, we are selling totes to raise money not only for the podcast, but also for Every Mother Counts. So you should check those out at thebirthhour.com slash support. We make an awesome Mother's Day gift for someone or for yourself. And they come with a bunch of awesome goodies from some amazing brands that are supporting this fundraiser, Earth Mama Angel Baby, Undercover Mama, Lansano, Walls Need Love, Natra Care, Parabo Press, and the Heart to Heart Store. So be sure to check out the link where it'll list everything that they come with. And we'll be talking more about that on Thursday as well. So be sure to tune in then. As always, you can connect with me on Instagram and Twitter at The Birth Hour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com to sign up for our newsletter. And if you really like the show, please subscribe and leave a review in iTunes. I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you've been listening to another episode of The Birth Hour. Thanks again.